Good evening all and welcome. Before you watch this video, I need to give you guys a dire warning. There are several mentions of abuse to adults, children and animals. So if this isn't your thing, please don't watch and go find another video to see. The stories today can get very dark. They start off strong and just keep going, to be honest. But if you're still here, good luck. Get comfortable because you're really going to let the darkness take control tonight. Me and my father didn't have the best relationship growing up, and this is why. To give you some context, I grew up in a rural area and made friends with a squirrel, and the little guy got tame around me. I could sit at the bench, and he would climb down, and I would pass him granola bars, and he would actually beg with his hands asking for the food. It was adorable. Well, one day my dad was cooking fish and drinking beer with his friends, and they see me on the bench drawing, and the squirrel comes down to say hello. They shout, ask what I'm doing, and I say I'm just chilling with my little buddy. Bear in mind I'm 10 years old at the time. They make a joke about my dad raising a Disney princess, and he gets angry and goes inside. He comes back out, and the next thing I know, the bench I was in is being knocked over, and the squirrel bails, and then boom. My little buddy had been shot. His friends had all been laughing until this very moment where they all fall quiet. He then tells me to wait by the fryer, and he proceeds to clean the squirrel and puts it in the deep fryer in front of me, forcing me to watch every minute. The most painful part is when I saw the eyes of what were my friend explode in the oil. He cooks it until it's done. Then, in front of his friends, he demands that I eat it. I say no, but he grabbed me by the collar, pops me three times, and tells me the squirrel got off easy. He could do a lot worse to me. I then proceed, painfully, to eat my friend that I had just been feeding and laughing with not 30 minutes ago. His friends lost their composure, and many of them left soon after. It was not a good day. Being made to eat a pet is not something I wish on anyone. I was dating this girl named Chelsea when I was in my early 20s. She lived in a nearby town. I had to drive for about an hour to go to her place and spent some days of the week there. We were working at the same company in a bigger city that was roughly in the middle of the way for both of us. Chelsea's town was quiet and had a lot of green around it. Several summer camps existed in the area as a kid and she would always spend the summer months there. After years of visiting those places, she ended up making a strong, united group of friends who grew up together. And they were all in their early 20s when they decided to live near one another. Some of them even worked as counsellors in one of their favourite camps. They were so integrated that almost every day at least one of them would show up to have dinner at Chelsea's place or invite us to hang out somewhere in the area. Super nice and friendly people, and within weeks I already felt like I was a part of it. The group had around six people, four girls including Chelsea and two guys called Rick and Tom. The guys were roommates and inseparable. Picture a random white dude wearing flannel light wash jeans and dirty Tims. That was Rick, a super common guy, and he had a daughter. He must have been 23 at the time, as the little girl Emma was around five. Her mom was a girl he met at a party called Alejandra. They hooked up and she got pregnant on the first and only night they spent together. As her parents were extremely Catholic, they insisted that her pregnancy was a gift from God and made her keep it. From the outside, this situation looked super under control and healthy. Alejandra was going to college, and the girl would stay at Rick's and Tom's place during the week. It's safe to say those two dudes were raising the kid. Rick had part-time jobs around the town, and would work as a camp counsellor over the summer. I knew him and the girl pretty well. I went to his apartment several times and played with the kid, as they would often visit Chelsea. But after a few months, Rick left the town looking for a better job. Everyone was baffled as no one was expecting him to leave. The girl stayed with her mother, and he went to the capital of the state. The routine changed completely now. Emma would only spend the weekends at her father's place, 
and her mother would drive her there. Apparently, Rick was doing fine. Some months later, Tuesday morning, I was sitting in my cubicle at work when Chelsea sends me a message, which was a bit odd. We have to talk. Meet me downstairs outside. Oh crap, what did I do? I go downstairs and she's crying uncontrollably. Her makeup is all messed up. What happened? I ask. She tells me that Rick's daughter is no longer among the living and that he is going to jail. Everything after that Tuesday became extremely odd, creepy and nonsense. The crime was just so brutal and gruesome that the whole state became aware of it. So Rick is taking a shower Sunday evening, getting ready to drive his daughter back to her mum's place and the girl is playing alone. He leaves the bathroom to get his clothes as the apartment was a one-room studio and sees Emma on the floor with a thick canvas bag around her head and lots of blood coming out. Desperate, he removes the bag to find his daughter's face completely disfigured and bloody. He places the bag over her head again and calls 911 and waits. That was Rick's first version of the story. He claims someone broke into his place while he was showering and ended the life of his little girl. Initially, the cops believed him, even though there was not a single sign of someone else in the scene, and upon inspection of the surveillance cameras, no one was seen breaking into his apartment and the windows were still shut. The autopsy of the body shows Nick's skin under the girl's nails and his fingerprints all over her body. Someone had restricted her oxygen supply, then used something to bash her several times over her head. They found a bloody t-shirt that belonged to Rick hidden under the bed. He never pleaded guilty, however during the trial he's changed his version to I don't remember what happened that night, I'm sorry. Why didn't you remove the bag? Police asked. Because it was not a nice thing to see, was his answer. Alejandra's interview that went live on television was just utterly terrifying. She claimed Rick had always been an unstable man with several mental health issues and would constantly bang his head onto the wall when feeling distressed. What the hell, was she really talking about Rick? Needless to say, the incident destroyed the group. No one could believe that Rick was that monster. They paid for a lawyer and some of them even went to court. They were all exposed by the media and the town shunned him. Tom couldn't believe his buddy had committed this monstrosity. He lived with the dude for years and even helped take care of the girl. The last time I heard from him, he was obsessed with the grim details of the case, trying to find evidence to release Rick from jail. Don't you guys think a violent person capable of taking the life of his own daughter would have shown signs of his true nature before? I would never understand that. Why in the world would he do that? Over four years ago, I went to work at a warehouse in the small town that I'm from. I decided to leave after my health started to get worse physically, and I was diagnosed with panic disorder and severe anxiety after the situation that I'm about to share with you. This changed the way that I developed friendships after that job, that's for certain. So I started this job on April 4th of 2018, which was odd to me and I had no kind of high expectation of the job. All I wanted to do was my job, get paid and go home, as I had two children at home and many things that I could work on there. The job wasn't hard and made pretty good money for all duties considered, so I couldn't really complain. I worked the second shift for about five months and then swapped to day shift. While working on second shift, I kept mostly to myself until one day, I met someone from one of the lines after we struck up a conversation about gaming. His name was John, and John was a pretty good guy, and we had a lot of things in common. I went home that night, and he popped up as a suggested friend on Facebook, so I decided to add him. When I did, we started talking more at work until he suggested we should hang out. So we did, frequently. We were friends for a month at this point, and one day he decided that he was going to introduce me to his partner. She seemed decent at first, super nice, didn't seem to be too judgmental, 
and I was cool with her. From then on, I would hang out with him when my kids were spending time with my mother. One time we were talking at a restaurant and he started to vent. Dude, she's such a cow sometimes. The other day I forgot to take the trash out and she threatened to stab me if I didn't. I've never been in a relationship where someone's threatened me, but she's got good intentions, dude. When he said that to me, I was concerned, but of course we had only been friends for a month or so and I thought maybe he was just being morbid in his jokes. I chuckled with him. He gave me a pretty serious look and said, I'm not joking, she really did. That concerned me. Fast forward about eight months, they're still together and we all hang out pretty frequently, forgetting the thing he told me. One day we were all talking and he seemed a little bit off that day, so I asked him what was wrong in front of her. He flashed a smirk and said, Nothing dude, I'm just a little tired. He didn't have his eyes on me though. He had them on her when I asked that. When we went to work the next day I asked him again. Alright, you promised to keep this between us though? Yeah, of course. He said that he was breaking up with her and she went a little crazy. She said that she grabbed her gun and pointed it at him and said, If I can't have you, no one will. He said that he defused the situation and is trying to look for a way out. Not really knowing what to say, I just said, You'll figure it out, man. If you need somewhere to go, you can come and stay with me until you get her out of the house. Fast forward another year, he finally decided to leave her. When he did, she flipped out again. This time, he told her over text. She said that she was going to find him and finish him. And he was actually out of work that day with a vacation. And he sent me a text that read, Hey, let me know if she comes over to work looking for me. That struck me kind of odd, because I had no idea of the situation that was unfolding. She actually did come to our job, and she asked me where he was, but I told her I had no idea. I thought he was with you, I said, and you guys went out of town or something. All she did was roll up her window and drive off. I called him and told him that she came by, and he called the police about it. They had found her up the road with a loaded gun in the car. Two months later, he decided to talk to her again, and when he did, he had something to tell me. When he called me, he asked if I had ever seen her around and hadn't. He said, I would take some vacation days if I were you. Dumbfounded, I asked him why, and he told me that it was because she was out of jail, and her cousins were in town trying to find the people she has personal vendettas with, and I was one of them. At that point, I was terrified. I grabbed my kids and went out of town, took two weeks off work. I come to find out that the next day, her and her cousins went to the next town over and shot three people in an apartment and ended them. I got the news about it the day after it happened, and the reason why he knew they were coming after me is because they made a Facebook messenger group that he was included in and sent a list of names. Everyone regarded it as spam and decided to disregard the messages, but he knew what it was. Three of the names on that list were the people that they shot. The fourth name was mine. After they found the evidence, he decided to go public about the group and screenshots that he had, and they were all charged with first-degree murder. From then on, I was very careful about who I would stick my neck out for, because even though he knew the context of that list and her intentions, he decided not to inform anyone else about it. Needless to say, we aren't friends anymore, and I dodged a bullet. Literally. I used to be employed as a child protection worker, and a report came through about a stepfather who was being abusive to his children, and I was given the investigation by my team leader. When I interviewed the oldest child with the police, she had very visible physical injuries and told me exactly what happened. I'll spare the details, but it was horrific. As the children were in his sole care, we knew that they needed to be removed immediately. We sent a team of two workers out to the children's school while myself and a colleague called the stepfather into the office. I led the interview, and it was horrible. He didn't even try to deny that he had hurt his stepchildren, basically saying, That's my kid. I'll do what I want and you can't stop me. When I served him with the paperwork, he lost his mind. He was swearing and screaming, If I were outside this building right now, I'd end you, man. We ended up running out of the interview room, pressing our emergency alarm, 
and I even had to make a police report about the whole thing. It got really messy. The next day, we had to go to court for the children, and my manager decided I shouldn't attend due to everything that had happened the previous day. My colleague, who was attending me, told me that this man was at court and yelled several times something to the effect of, Where is that, insert string of profanities, worker who took my kid? I remember feeling a little freaked out, but it's not uncommon to hear things similar to this when you have to remove a child. It's understandable that emotions are very high. You build a bit of resilience working in this field, and overall, I mainly felt relieved that those children had been placed with an aunt and were safe. About two weeks later, I had to stay back late at the office on an unrelated job. It was around 9pm when I finished and I was the only person there. I walked out to the back of the building to my car. It was dark, but when I got close I thought I saw a shadow moving in front of my car. Just for a second and then it was gone. It was about 20 meters away at this point but it startled me and I stood there for a moment wondering if I was just being paranoid. While staring into the darkness, I started hearing tiny rustling noises, and whether imagined or not, all of the true crime horror stories I've ever heard flashed into my mind. Safe to say, I freaked myself out and sprinted back to the building. I called my boyfriend to come and collect me and explain what happened. By the time he drove up to the front doors, I had convinced myself I was being silly and asked him to drive me around to my car. He circled around with all the headlights shining on my car, and I could very clearly see that all four of my tyres had been slashed. I was an absolute mess that night, and called the police immediately. I was pretty sure this man was responsible, but as I hadn't seen him, I couldn't say for sure. I took a few days off and came back to a meeting with my manager, who had put together a safety plan for me and the other staff. She'd organised to have security guards escort us to our cars, and said very clearly that no one was to stay in the building after hours alone. Then after about a week later, a letter was delivered to the office addressed to me. Any mail that comes into the office goes through our reception staff, and our lovely receptionist opened it, and it was a note that said, You're as good as dead. The words were typed and printed. She was an older woman and burst into tears when she read it. It didn't say who had sent it, but I was convinced it was the same man. Over the next few weeks, letters kept coming, each one getting longer. They addressed me as female dog and homewrecker, saying that I kidnapped and abused children. It was just horrible, horrible stuff. The threats in the letters were the worst. The person writing them threatened to abuse me sexually, torture and end my life, find out where I lived, and was willing to burn down my entire building. To be honest, the police were less than helpful. They basically said that given the nature of our work, we couldn't conclusively say it was the man, although they had questioned him. To me, it seemed like a pretty massive coincidence. I'd never had anything like this happen before. They did say they were taking the letters very seriously and tracking down where they had been posted from, but I never heard anything about that again. My workplace took the threats very seriously too, all of the security was bumped up across the building and all staff completed refresher training on emergency management. One day, on the way home from work, I noticed a car was following me. At first, I thought I was being paranoid, so I drove down a bunch of little streets, doubling back onto the same route, in a way that would make absolutely no sense. Even after all, the dark green Camry was still paced a little way behind me. I freaked out, but had already planned in my head what I was going to do in this situation, head straight to the police station, planning to pull right up to the front of the building and beep my horn until I had someone's attention. And the second I pulled into the police station, the green Camry drove straight past and disappeared down a nearby side street. I sat there for a good 20 minutes, too scared to leave the car, in case they came back around the corner. It dawned on me that in my panic, I'd forgotten to get the license plate and this upsets me to this day. I told the police what I knew, but they told me that the man didn't have a car registered to his name. This was the final straw for me. I was a nervous wreck. I was looking around constantly in work at home, and I knew he lived relatively close to me, so I even stopped going grocery shopping in case I saw him there. 
I stayed on stress leave for a month and heard from colleagues that the letters kept arriving. I was honestly ready to quit but then COVID happened and that really changed everything. Everyone went into lockdown and all access to the office was restricted. I started working from home, driving a work car to and from appointments and didn't go to the office anymore barely. I was only allowed in small working groups when absolutely necessary. Over the next year, the letters slowed and eventually stopped. By the time we were allowed back in the office, there hadn't been any sign of this man for nearly seven months. About a year later, I left child protection. I don't know what happened to those children, but my hope is that they are happy and safe with their family. And as for the man who I believe stalked and threatened me for doing my job, I sincerely hope to never see you again. When I was in elementary school, we went on a class trip to one of those old colonial towns to see how life was back then for settlers. During lunch break, I went to the bathroom and a man paid me to take pictures of me in the bathroom. I was really excited to get money. Next thing I knew, I was in a police car scared out of my mind that I was in trouble. I kept apologizing to the cop while my mum told me to calm down. I remember crying all night that my principal would hate me because I made the cops come. It was an odd memory. I suppose what really did happen is that they had caught the man and arrested him, and I was just put there for my own protection. I don't remember all the details specifically as this was years ago, but it's quite disturbing to think about what the man could have done had the police not arrived then sooner. When I was about six years old, I was at Dairy Queen with my mum and brothers. My mum needed to change the baby's diaper, so she asked this guy sitting at a table near us on the patio to watch my four-year-old brother and I. She had seen him around before and thought of him as a friendly neighbour. Everything was fine, she came back and none of us were in harm's way at all, and the neighbour and us shortly parted ways. A few weeks later, we were watching the news when our neighbour shows up. It was Clifford Robert Olson. And if you don't know who this person is, he was a convicted Canadian serial killer who confessed to taking the lives of 11 children and teenagers between the ages of 9 and 18 in the early 1980s. So, there you have it. My parents didn't obviously have very much to say on the matter, having nearly missed us, probably disappearing for good. But I imagine he must have been smirking and thinking at the time, Jesus lady, you're lucky they're a bit young for my taste. In any case, I'm glad he was arrested and the neighborhood was purged from this scum forever. I was neighbors and friends with a beautiful family of four that lived three houses up from me. This was when I was a child, and this specific day was the 14th of January 1980. My parents and I took a walk after dinner and stopped to chat with Teresa of 30, Lisa Lynn of 5, Gregory Patrick of 4, as they were getting ready to head back to their grandparents' house where their dad, Patrick, age 30, was finishing up working with Teresa's dad. They were going to go eat dinner and watch the peanut special It's Valentine's Day Charlie Brown. My mum and dad chatted with Teresa, and I ran around the little oak, talking with my friends Lisa and Greg. They were precious. I'd known them since I was five years old and had moved to the neighbourhood, and they were like the little brother and sister I never had. But never did any of us know it would be for the last time as we hugged and said our goodbyes and they left. We carried on with our walk, and moments later the convicted killer, although we didn't know that at the time, Donald Ray Wallace Jr. drove from a dead-end section of the neighbourhood straight towards us. As we made eye contact, I had a horrible feeling, as if I was in the presence of something evil. My dad pulled me away from the car, and we continued on our walk. I told my parents that he was a very bad man, and he drove erratically towards the exit. He was casing our neighbourhood, and after a while, when we got home, Mum and I stopped to talk about our next-door neighbour, and my dad went inside. He got his 3.57 Magnum 
and went through the entire house while Mum and I were still outside. We didn't know it at the time. Later that night, before we went to bed, I shut my shade in front of my window and saw his car parked across the street diagonal from our house. I got my dad and he assured me everything was fine. I had the worst feeling after making eye contact with him. When I saw the car again, my heart went up in my throat. Dad did not sleep that night. He had the same horrible feeling I had. He had snuck out to get the vehicle make. He didn't sit at the window to watch though. He didn't want to be noticed. After midnight, the doorbell rang and two Indiana State Police officers that initially discovered my precious friends were going door to door with other officers. My dad looked at the peephole after turning on the porch light and saw them. He opened the door and one of them could barely look up. They were checking to make sure everyone else was okay and asking if anyone had seen or heard anything and to please let them know. They could only say to us that there had been a homicide. They gave my dad a card because he said he had. They continued to other neighbours, but I didn't hear the doorbell. But later I heard my dad shuffling down the hallway. I called out to him and he said everything was fine and he was thirsty and got a drink of water and was going back to bed. I rolled over and went back to sleep, never imagining what the next few hours would reveal. Needless to say, my poor parents had to break the news to me at the kitchen table. I knew it was the bad man, and my dad fell on his knees, tears in his eyes while holding me, telling me that he was going to tell the police, that the bad man would not get away with it, and that I mustn't say anything to anyone about it because he was going to take care of it, and he would not let the bad man or anyone else hurt Mum and me, or our little friends. He then said that they were with Jesus. I was in absolute shock. My parents didn't want me to be around the neighbourhood because of the international and national press and the local reporters were great, but the big city press were like hyenas and the crime scene activity going on in our small tight-knit neighbourhood. He was also going to give a witness statement to the ISPS along with my mama, although she didn't see Wallace like my dad and I did. I was just a child and he didn't want me brought into it. After the funeral and some time passing, we learnt how the true events transpired. He had not only broken into their house, but had also planned this for a while and broke into the neighbours that lived to the right of them as well. He went there first, they were out of town, then he broke into my friend's home. If only he had gone to theirs first, they would have not walked in on him and they would still be alive today. He tried to say he was not alone. He apparently had an unnamed accomplice who actually did the termination of the family. But this was untrue as his usual partner in crime was in jail. Wallace himself had only been out of jail a few weeks for another burglary that both he and his partner had committed in the past. As with both of our neighborhood crime scenes, they found their entry points had the glass taped with duct tape and the glass was cut or broken so it would not shatter and make loud noises. It also made for a quicker entry. At my friend's house, they found a print as well. These clues along with the neighbors they encountered like my dad helped them identify him quickly. He had a long history of petty crimes with several recent home robberies being the most serious. Until that night, he went from our neighborhood directly to his girlfriend's house. It was her car that he had driven. She would turn on him after he went into hiding, when the police showed up to the house after she caught them. Allegedly, he came over to the home that he shared with his girlfriend, her mother and younger sister right after he left my friend's home. She showed the police where he had tried to burn the jacket he was wearing and he gave them a diamond ring that had belonged to a Mrs. G someone some isotoner gloves that were also a Mrs. G someone's that she had gotten for Christmas that he took and used not to leave prints. He had a gun, transistor radio equipment, a police scanner, cash and ammo, as well as other things. Some of it came from the other's home next door, but the rest were later identified as Mrs. Sam and her sister Diana's. 
He had told his girlfriend that he did something really bad to a man and he had to tie some people up, but it went wrong that some people got shot. However, he was stupid enough to pose with her in several Polaroid pictures that he convinced his girlfriend's little sister to take of him and the stuff, and even one with his girlfriend, but this was before he told her what had really happened. He later confessed to taking the life of a family with little kids. She had caught him burning the clothes in the back of her mum's property and said he had to disappear and lay low for a while. He gave her the ring. I could go on about the depravity of it all. She dropped him off where he had been staying, but he didn't stay there long and ended up climbing into an elderly lady's attic that very night. He climbed on the outside and opened the window and climbed in. He had the scanner, the police gloves and listened to a channel to see if the crimes had been discovered. Their lives were taken at around 8.30 and discovered by the neighbours that were out of town's son-in-law and his rookie partner who were state police officers. Obviously, once the bodies were discovered, the information went out to all the local police nearby and he was eventually captured, where he tried to feign mental insanity and not competent to stand trial. But he was heard by an inmate that he was faking it. They told law enforcement officers and he was tested again and found competent to stand trial. In 1982, his trial was moved to Vigo County in Terre Haute, Indiana. He was found guilty of capital murder and had acted alone. He was sentenced to death. It took 25 years for him to exhaust his appeals and he served his last days at Michigan City State Maximum Security Prison in Michigan City, Indiana in death row. His life was taken from him by lethal injection on the 10th of March 2005. I personally think he should have got 350 years in a small room for most of his days and made to contemplate about the horrors that he committed and for what but I'll never get my friends back. I'm older now, of course, but I'll never forget them and the horror that they were put through for the stupidity and callousness of one selfish idiot. This happened at the end of summer 2021, and I was reminded because of Facebook memories. A little context, from ages 16 to 19, I was being abused by my ex and his mother, Monica. I lived with them because I was kicked out and she had power of attorney over me. Her name wasn't Monica, but it was a super unique name and I haven't seen anyone else have it before. It was a Friday night in the middle of a neighborhood filled with bars and clubs, so me and my fiance wanted to go out. I got all dolled up and my fiance went to the bar about 30 minutes before me so he could grab some food from a pizza place near the bar. Once I finished getting ready, I hopped out of my apartment and started heading to the bar that was like three blocks away. I noticed a homeless woman outside my apartment, but I shrugged it off. There were always homeless people in my neighborhood since it was downtown. As we walked past her, I heard her turn and start walking behind me. It definitely creeped me out, but I assumed she was just heading my way or gonna ask to bum a cig or something, but no. What happened next sent a shiver down my spine. Monica, Monica. The woman called to me in a raspy smoker's voice. I froze, I hadn't heard that name in years and I was terrified. I took a deep breath assuming she had confused me for someone and it was a big coincidence so I turned back to her and smiled. Oh, sorry ma'am, I'm not Monica, I'm Lila. Hope you find Monica though. Have a good night. And I walked away. No, Monica, I know who you are. She said as she grabbed my shoulder and turned me towards her again. I was frozen in fear at this point and finally got a good look at her up and down. She was probably in her early 60s with brown hair and grown out grey roots, had multiple coats on and ripped scrub pants, but the most noticeable were her eyes. They were dark and her pupils were so large they were almost engulfed in the dark brown iris. Before I could respond, she looked deeply into my eyes and said in a calm voice, Are you ready to die tonight, Monica? I instantly went into fight or flight and smacked her hand off my shoulder and turned to run to the bar. My hand in my purse on my pepper spray if she tried to follow, but she didn't. Instead, she just laughed maniacally. 
I could hear her laugh echo in my ears along with her questions as I ran into the bar. I found my fiancé and just broke down sobbing. He calmed me and went to get me a drink, then walked me home a few hours later to make sure she wasn't there. The next morning I heard from a neighbour that the sports bar across the street from the bar I went to had a fatal shooting out front about two hours after I left. A man shot and ended the life of one person and hurt two more. He was arrested six months later and was connected to another bar shooting a month prior, where only one person was injured. The shooting seemed completely random, and I never saw the woman again, and moved away a few months later. I'm going to tell you about the story of my brief encounter with a man called Happy. In 2013, I'm working at a cannabis dispensary in Venice Beach, a block from the boardwalk. A good 35% of our patrons were unhoused people. Occasionally, someone experiencing severe psychosis would try and come in, but if they were screaming or unintelligible, security would not let them in. If they had and presented the holy trinity of medical papers, ID and cash, they were good to go. We had a compassion program where we'd bag up grams of shake left over from the bottoms of jars and give them completely free. One person per day to anyone who asked. Word about this spread quickly on the boardwalk. Generally, these people would be the nicest, most polite and considerate customers, even if they did smell a bit stinky and their money got pulled from sweaty socks. No one working there would bat an eye if someone came in smelling like they'd slept on the beach for a week next to a bottle of vodka, as long as they just calmly buy their weed and be on their way like any other customer. It's a foggy, chilly day around the holidays, sometime between Thanksgiving and Christmas. So I'm in the back room when someone called out. I was the only person in the back, bud tending, and there were other employees at reception and the security guard at the front door. I'm alone there, there are cameras but no one actively watching them, and this guy walks in after being checked in at the front. He's the only customer at the moment, and I swear the whole room gets colder as he walks in. He's wearing a very worn-in, deeply faded, wrinkled, conformed to his body, floor-length duster jacket and a similarly beaten up, wide-brim leather cowboy hat. It looks like he's lived and slept in the same clothes for years. We did not allow hats, hood or sunglasses in the stores, so I'm surprised that security didn't ask him to remove his hat. The man is at least 6 foot 5 and built like a boulder, not obese kind of large, they pick you up and toss you like a ragdoll kind of large. The stench that accompanied him was unlike anything I'd ever smelt before or since. It was beyond B.O., beyond piss or poo and smelled like actual death, as if he had raw, rotting carcasses tucked under his thick, long leather coat. I thought I had been hardened by plenty of nasty body stank before, but this was absolutely revolting far beyond anyone who hasn't showered lately or pissed their pants. I'm trying not to inhale very deeply and I just say, Hi sir, excuse me. I'm sorry, would you like mind taking off your hat? Just store policy. With a big customer service smile as I ask what he's looking for today. He grunts deeply. He's walking very slowly, shuffling and dragging his feet. His voice sounds like he gargles with gravel, rough and wet raw and angry. I don't take off my hat. At this point, I'm not trying to argue with the man about his hat either. Let him in and out. I glance down and see he isn't wearing shoes either. The bit I can see from under his coat, one of his ankles, is massively bruised and swollen, melon-sized. The bottom of both his feet are bloody and torn up. I realize he is leaving a slight trail of blood as he drags his ragged feet across the concrete floor of the shop. My first thought is how the hell did security let him in? Second is this guy's obviously injured, and that is concerning as a human being. I'm making sure to keep the display shelf between me and the guy, but that's only about a foot of space, like a bar. He gets to me and the stench was stronger. I meekly but sincerely ask, Are you alright, sir? His eyes flare at me. What do you care? And I'm like, Welp, I tried. 
Not my chair, not my problem. Not my money, not my circus. Great, what can I get for you? He pulls up one of his sleeves to expose his forearm. It's covered in large round burns from like a cigar. Some old, healed, and some fresh, pussy and infected. It's not track marks, it's burns. He also has a jagged, homemade looking stick and poke tattoo of a smiley face. A crooked circle, two lines for the eyes, and a scabbed up curve of a smile. He points to this tattoo. Happy. My name is Happy. The rotting stink was so strong, and I needed to breathe in little gasps the least possible. I walked here. I walked all the way from Pasadena. I'm like, wow, well, sir, that's a really long way to walk. Anyway, what are you looking for today? Just for you. His eyes are dark and menacing. He is smeared with a layer of grime like he lived in the woods dirty. He doesn't look like the average crust punk or disabled veteran you generally see living on the beach. It was hard to guess his age, but he wasn't that old or young. I had to guess between mid-thirties to fifties. He looked like he dragged himself here from his log cabin. Like what would happen if you entangled some quantum mechanics poorly and mixed Ed Game with 1800s homesteader and transported him to 2013 Venice Beach. I of course have never seen this man before. Once was more than enough to make him unforgettable. He keeps staring at me, and I move as far back as I can to the wall, hopefully out of his grasp if he lunged. I would need to walk out from behind the case and around him to get to the security guard. I'm weighing my options. I decide to grab a bunch of compassion grams and then weigh out an eighth and mark it down that I'd pay for it later. And he's just leering at me, wheezing heavily, stinking breaths. We actually have a special today, only for people who walked more than 10 miles to get here. This is all for you on the house. Thanks for stopping by. He accepts the bag but continues to just stand there and stares at me. Thank you. Happy? It worked. He grunts a guttural noise that was not a word and slowly turns and shuffles back towards the door. At the door, he turned back towards me and says, I'll see you later. He finally walks out, leaving plenty of his residual stench of death behind. Thank any and all of the gods I did not see happy later or ever again. When I asked security why the hell they let him in, he said that when he had noticed his bloody feet and said, Hey bro, you all good? That looks like it hurts. Happy had stepped up to his face and threatened to choke him out. And since it was just him and a 22-year-old 130-pound girl, he wasn't trying to die tonight and figured hopefully Happy would just get his stuff and leave. He was watching the cameras in the back ready to call the police and owners if anything got weird. Apparently, he had different definitions of weird, but I understood his reaction and ultimately we were all fine, just spooked and plenty creeped out. And now, needing to clean blood off the floor with bleach and gloves and texting our boss that he owed us free weed about it. He agreed, and we all lived happily ever after. Okay guys, thank you so much for watching. Those were pretty strong. Most of them anyway were damn really bad so yeah i i didn't intend to make a video with <laughs> the like all the worst stories that i've like some of the worst stories i've read in the last few months but there you go so sometimes it just happens um i hope you enjoyed in a not messed up kind of way and if you want to see more they won't be this bad links on screen now and a huge thanks as always to my members and patrons whose names can be seen on screen. If you would like to support the channel to get some fancy perks, you can find out how to do that by following the links in the description. And also I posted new content for members and patrons, some trucker stories if you are so inclined. But that's it from me. More links on screen now. Stay awesome and I'll see you in the next one.